I spent this afternoon building Dyson spheres. What? You can't do that by yourself. You need at least like three other people to absorb all the radiation emitted by a star. Look, phase one, (laughs) build a giant mecha. Phase Mm -hmm. two, build a bunch of factories that build the parts of other stuff. Phase three, question mark. Phase four, (laughs) absorb all the energy of the sun. (laughs) Profit and whatever the energy absorption version of profit is. Look. Mr. Burns built the shade over Springfield. That worked out well for him. If I, yeah. I, I don't know if I ever saw the end of that episode, but I feel like like it's a good strategy. That game. Never really saw you as an industrial magnate before, but I guess, uh, you know, people pivot careers all the time. I, is there is there something broken about my psyche that makes those kind of factory slash world devourer games so compelling to me? I was not. So I, I sat in on a video and watched Finney play that game yeah. this week. And I I don't know why it didn't occur to me, but I was not ready for the world devouring aspect of that game. It's just like to me, it was just a very positive, like, uh, you know, it was an additive like, oh, let's build this thing. It, it, the part uh-huh. where you have to basically strip mine an entire solar system in order to do that. It Multiple kind of, solar it systems. It kind of escaped me that you essentially you're like you really would have to just eradicate every planet in the system to even come close to doing something like I, that. I don't think there's enough. I, th- I think. The lo- hmm. This is hazy memory, but I believe that there's not enough mass in the solar system to make even a ring really uh, uh, around the sun at the orbit that you would need to do a Dyson sphere for it to be stable. So, so when you say the orbit you would need, is that like the minimum safe distance or is that more the optimal like energy absorption range? Look, I'm not a NASA scientist, but my understanding <laughs> Is that you have to be a certain distance for the speed to go for it to rotate at a speed that it's going to give you one G of gravity. OK, when you're standing on the inside looking up at the sun. Interesting. That's not the limiting factor I would have expected, but OK. But also like even to do that, it would be like making a, a aluminum foil, like a thing, a few atoms thick all the way around. We still don't have enough mass. So you got to get interstellar travel before <sighs> you can think about doing this. We are nowhere near even a type two, not even a type one civilization yet. No. Have, have you... Have you ever read like hard science fiction about about like rings and uh, the? have you read Ian Banks books? No, I've always thought about I've, I've read about him. I've thought about dabbling with his stuff. So uh, first off, only read his books that are by Ian M. Banks, because like those denote the science fiction books. The other ones are often disconcerting with huh. wasps and things. Interesting. Um, but but the culture books are fabulous. And yeah, I've heard like are the best kind of weird high hard science fiction from the distant distant future um and they talk about like one of those books is set on a ring world that col- that society collapsed on and because there's no minerals and stuff buried in the earth underneath the bottom of the ring there's just it's just it's just ring once society collapses they can't start back from basics and rebuild it it has to be bootstrapped by people outside the ring so it's like there's like feral. I, I'm going to say humans, but I think they're probably not humans <laughs> okay. on the, the that inhabit this ring in like a pre- Neolithic world where they're taking scraps of metal and stuff they find from the environment and and using those to make spears and shit. Sounds when true. When there's like laser engines and stuff all around and they just don't know how to use it because it's magic and demons and all that. It's he's very good. That sounds very high. It's very high concept. I, the um, the book I was reading about by him recently, mm-hmm. I think is a one. I think is a one off. I don't think it was part of any series, but I can't remember the name of it. Um, it seemed to be like the actual plot, I think, was some kind of like spy fiction, like assassination plot, murder mystery, kind of high intrigue sort of thing. But the thing that caught my attention was that it was set on a rogue planet, yeah. which is to say a planet that has been ejected from from its galaxy. No, that's a that's a culture book. Uh, oh, is it really? Yeah, or at least from its solar system. Yeah. Okay, but it, it, interesting. Yeah, but like what I gathered from reading the synopsis is that that detail didn't even really have any bearing on the plot. I just I can really appreciate that you would you would incorporate such an exotic concept into your story and not even really focus on it. It's just kind of there. Oh yeah, like it's it's those culture books are neat because they they are in a distant enough future that like spaceships are sentient hive minds. This is what Elon Musk names the landing ships after, like the the go not gently into this dark night or whatever the landing ships are named. Those are all culture ship names. And they're, they're not like spaceships. The way we think of spaceships is like a a metal skin with stuff around them. They're just like force fields encompassing Mm -hmm. a mass of, of like, of like houses and stuff uh, that just travels through space. And they just kind of go like they just don't stop. They just kind of keep going on these big routes and you can jump on and jump off and there's smaller ones and bigger ones. And it's a trip. They're, they're really good. Like you said, magic. 
magic. Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. I briefly forgot the name of the show there. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you could have fooled me. I did not notice. The, the pause was very pregnant. Seamless. Look, sometimes sometimes things just, uh, you, you just, they just run out of juice and you forget their Shit. name. <laughs> and then you just like, everybody walks away and stops making it like uh, maybe Google Stadia. I don't That's know. True. That's true. Wow. Incredible segue. Yes, we, here we are. It was recording. a stretch. This is a rare late on a Friday recording. So bear with us. <laughs> the show is a little all over the place. It's also like 85 degrees in my office right yeah, now. I've been playing games in here with the door shut all day. It's warm here, too. I was enjoying the cold weather, but eh, here we are. Yeah, well, I had to take the sweatpants off and put on different sweatpants that are slightly warm, uh, less warm. The breathable. Uh, but yeah, so there was Google Stadia news a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And I, I've i played a little bit of stuff on Stadia. Like I played a, um, PUBG sent me codes for PUBG on Stadia. And I, I, mean, I don't think I realized PUBG. I should I should know this, but I didn't realize PUBG was on Stadia for some reason. Well, so I was interested in playing it because I wanted to see what rendering I, I should say sorry but, well i just or, want to see what rendering in the cloud did to desync because like that game is a little bit desynky at the best of times and i wanted to see if moving the renderer back and transferring it to video was going to make that stuff go away and it kind of it it just changes the way it feels a little bit but nobody sure. ever really played it there so it wasn't it wasn't an issue yeah um it didn't get a develop it didn't get an audience like it did on say like destiny 2 has it seems like and, yeah. and some other stuff so, yeah, Google essentially has discontinued first party development of games by its internal studios for the Stadia platform. And they're kind of talking about pivoting to some sort of technology licensing sort of well, situation. Well, they, and, but they also said they I mean, Phil, Phil Harrison said explicitly that they were just going to work with partners to bring games to the platform, yes, not yes. develop games themselves. Yes, yes, yes. The, the 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 branded Stadia platform will persist and they will continue to add third party games to it. I don't know if they'll ever get around to the what it seems like they should have done from the beginning, which is the flat subscription fee for a lineup of games, as opposed to purely selling games a la carte for money. It seems like, I don't know why they thought that was the way to go, especially with Google's reputation for killing things, which is the whole point of this conversation. Uh, and yeah. with the, and with the extra ephemeral nature of buying games that only exists in a streaming format, like people, you know, enough people are already skittish about buying digital games that at least still live on a hard drive under their TV. Like when yeah. you even take that out of the equation and it literally is not even in your house anymore. Like, I, I feel like, you know, not, we're not really here to dissect their business model so much, but like, I feel like even that they were kind of shooting themselves in the foot from day one. Well, like the biggest, if we want to postmortem, the service is not dead yet. The biggest mistake that they made was that when they launched this thing that was $120, $130 buy-in at the beginning, and they didn't actually like launch with any games really that used the features of it, nor were they working actively with third parties and saying, hey, uh, we will pay you to bring your third party game. We, like we'll, we will cover the cost of porting your third party game to our weird new platform because we want there to be a bunch of games. So they ended up launching with like a bunch of three, four year old games and like two original IPs that kind of nobody cared about. And then slowly rolled out other like Destiny eventually came like when Destiny 2 went free to play, it came to Stadia and a bunch of other a bunch of other kind of games like that landed. And then they had internal studios as well. But like, like, I don't want to be the old guy that's talking about the Nintendo 64, but nobody would have bought that machine if it didn't come with Mario 64. And like something as weird and new as Stadia needed it's own Mario 64. Totally. And they I mean, didn't what, do it. You, know, you get into the whole chicken and egg problem of like, how do you make games before there's a platform, but how can you have a platform when there are no games? I mean, you know, there's you just, write big checks, Brad. <laughs> that's well, how yeah, you but, do it. Yeah. But also, you know, games take years to make and you need to do it in secret. If you're not even talking publicly about the platform they're going to run on yet. Um, but, and, 
Well, and in addition to writing big checks, you also have to make those big investments. Like, it's not like it's not like Google doesn't have money to spend. I mean, that, so, I mean like, we will get into that later in this episode, because I think that is really the meta question I have around this, which is how does a company as flush with resources as Google kill stuff off like this? And I suspect there are probably bureaucratic, mm-hmm. deeply bureaucratic reasons for that. But we'll, we'll get there in a little bit. Um, but yeah, like the upshot is they they are no longer developing Stadia games themselves internally. They've laid off the people at the studios they had built to do that. The Stadia platform will be around and they will continue letting for third parties put games on there. Yeah. But the kind of X factor to this and probably the thing that's maybe the most relevant to this podcast is this. Uh, I'm going to quote from this Kotaku article that Stephen Totillo wrote like minutes before the <laughs> official blog post went up. He kind of he broke this news and he's got a little bit more like I guess, straight talk about what they're doing than Phil Harrison's blog post, which was a lot more corporate sounding. Um, Google plans to begin offering its Stadia tech to publishers, opening up the possibility for Stadia to become the streaming tech for other video game companies, which sounds to me more like hmm. a middleware situation than like that, that, that. To me, that doesn't sound like, hey, you're going to put your games on a platform called Stadia. You're going to get access to the underlying like, you know, kind of codex and input latency minimization and whatever other like custom stuff they built in the, in the stack to make Stadia run. Yeah. They, that, like they, that, they, they built custom video you? codex and stuff right. for that thing. It's like, it's bonkers. Like, is that, is that what that line sounds like to you? Like, is this straight up going to turn into like a licensing operation to me? That says that if I have the right flags in my Google developer account, I go into the app console and there's an opportunity for me to upload my Stadia app that then is delivered however I see. So like, it may not be something that you deliver through the Stadia service. It may be that, you know how you know how all the high end games are landing on Switch these days, and it's like Hitman Three is a streamed yes is a streamed version of Hitman running from the cloud someplace. Yes, that's my guess is what they're saying okay. is like look. So Google Google's weird in that they often have they have problems that normal companies don't have in that like when when they launched Gmail they had this problem in that they had a whole buttload of storage that they weren't really using for anything and they're like well what can we do with the storage everybody has run out of space in their email all the time let's, let's give just, them a gig of email space what can we do with the storage let's just give it away yeah but but i mean in giving it away they also developed a market for that and then we all got addicted to the storage oh, yeah. and now i'm paying money to google every year cuz i have too much fucking email yes um but but like that's that is a Looking at that with compute, like they've added compute, CPU compute, they've added GPU compute, and that stuff's great for machine learning, but that market is relatively small. Like it's a it's a market that uses a lot of a lot of that service, but it's not billions of consumers using it. It's it's hundreds of thousands or millions of people using that that machine learning stuff. So what can they apply the resources to in Slack time, even if it's a small, relatively small scale? at a consumer business worldwide. It's, it's, it's interesting. And the other thing, so the other thing, not to jump back a little bit, but the thing that when you read that Totillo quote from the Kotaku article, it makes me think that, look, realistically, if they're making bets and they, they've been given X number of million dollars, are they better off spending $50 million building a big AAA title internally that could be a hit or a miss one way or the other? Like that's, that is a hard thing to do for people who've been doing it for, for decades. Uh, and companies have been doing it for decades. Like the fact that Activision, that uh, Ubisoft ships an Assassin's Creed game more or less every year is a miracle. So is it better for Google to spend that $50 million on one big, big ass triple A game? Or is it better for them to spend, a, you know, a million or half a million getting 40 or 50 or more triple A games that they know are successes on that platform or from successful franchises? And like the latter is probably the better business decision. It, yeah. it isn't a big vote of confidence in the platform, though. Oh, I don't think. definitely not. Like, I mean, it certainly does make you wonder if the days are numbered for Stadia, period. Not just for first party, but just as a platform. But I mean, look, Google kills anything at any moment. They'll kill it. <laughs> look, right. Search. We're turning it off. Search is going away. Duck, duck, goose is your new future. Enjoy right, and it. Again, and again, that's why the, the game ownership issue was such a problem for me. I mean, conceptually, I was never going to buy one of those games anyway because I wouldn't trust Google with something like that. But like nobody should have. Right. Because if that service does go away, what happened to those purchases? Like, I guess I we guess Google them. is a Google is a big enough company that like maybe they would do something for you if you would spend a bunch of money on the platform. I don't know what form that would take, but. 
I mean, it's all what what will happen is all in the licenses. So like if the service goes away and it's Google's fault, then then there's probably terms in the contract that you agree to when you sign up to for a Stadia account that say, hey, we will refund blah, 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 minus right. depreciation or whatever over the yeah. course of time. Or we'll give I mean, you a gift card for, you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, you know, if this were a startup that had taken a bunch of VC to make this happen and it was their sole business model and they bet the farm on it and they went away like that, you would just lose all that stuff. Right. Like it, it was just isn't like Gaikai or on live. Right. Right. It would just go poof. But yeah, Google obviously is, you know, being being one of the biggest companies in the world, you would think they would at least do something for people that are stuck in that situation. But um, yeah, like, do, is there much more to expand on, you think, with this this stuff about them extending the technology to other companies? Well, I mean, I think I think. I, the other companies to me says, hey, EA is releasing Madden and they want it to run on Switch but it's not going to run on switch or they want it to run on phones, but it's too, too, you know, especially with ray tracing and stuff in the newer games that are launching on the, on the new consoles, like that stuff, there's no hope of back. If you already, if you're, if you're, there's a time in the not too distant future when games will be developed ray tracing first, probably it's already happening, right? Cause they'll start to assume that people have 2000 series Nvidia cards and, and, uh, uh, what what is it? Big Nobby, whatever the current gen ATI yeah, or, AMD cards are. R, R DNA two. R DNA two. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On PC, and, and and the big thing is the consoles, of course. Now yeah. that both both consoles have it, that, that will start trickling down from there. Yeah. So if you're looking at if you're looking at as a PC vendor, as a, as a game publisher, do we write two full pipelines and do two full sets of the assets that are required to make ray tracing work and the traditional raster renderer work? Then then do you. Do you go out and launch, do you do that work or do you just pay Google X number of dollars on every sixty dollar, seventy dollar copy sold so that you can put that game on switch and hit the 60 million people or whatever own switches now? Google just talked to me. <laughs> they know they're listening. Fuck. But yeah, I mean, the, the point is, it's probably cheaper to pay to run it on Stadia than it is to build a second renderer if you're looking in the future two years. Right. And that's what that's what Google is really good at looking at the future and seeing, oh, is this a business that's going to grow or is this a business that's going to fade? And they don't keep the ones that are fading around for very long. Yeah, you can say that again. We'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, I wonder, uh, especially in a marketplace like the Switch, like the eShop, I wonder how much the fact that a game is streaming starts kind of getting buried below the fold or whatever the fold equivalent is on a store page. You know what I mean? Where like they sell the game, but they don't necessarily call attention to the fact that it's not running locally, that it's a streaming thing. I mean, I guess, I guess you always have to give people enough of a heads up to make sure their connections are adequate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would assume, but at this point everybody has, you know, Netflix and like the connection for a 720p stream on a handheld switch is not that much different than, watching Netflix, right? Right. Yeah. Latency so I, probably matters I, I, more. I guess the, the bigger question I'm wondering about is when in the consumer's mind that distinction stops mattering so much. Like Yeah, I'm I'm looking to see what what Hitman looks like in the in the store. Here it is. Hitman 3 cloud version free. So I guess they do a demo so you can play it and get it going. Like the thing that's interesting to me about this is for games like if you look at Call of Duty it's a bazillion gigabytes. I don't, I play Call oh, of Duty yeah. maybe once a month. A 70 meg version of Call of Duty that just lives on the, on my computer and I, and I tap into the cloud whenever I want to play actually sounds like a much better way to play that than devoting 250 gigs of my hard drive to that right now. Sure. So I like, I'm not, I'm not averse to this. I, I like, I think, I don't know. They, they, it's called Hitman 3 cloud version. And it doesn't the on the PC, at least the store page doesn't say anything about. Uh, let's see, does it say you need a network connection? No, it just says cloud version. Oh, wait, here we go. You can only download a free launcher to test the game for a limited amount of time. The game uses cloud streaming technology and you require a nearly a persistent high speed Internet connection to play the game. If your connection becomes unstable, the service will disconnect after a few minutes. Please use the free launcher to test the availability and quantity quality of service for your region. So there you go. Yeah, I, I think that's I in wanna, the small print. OK, I, I want to say language like cloud version or cloud edition has, has started becoming pretty common. So I wonder if you have to have I guess you don't have to have online to play that because it's a single player game. And it doesn't say online required, even though it is only is coming across the network. Weird. Right. What a weird future. It's a very strange. <laughs> we 
I did not expect it to spiral out in all these weird directions. Yeah, um, me either. So, I mean, I, I'm having to resist the urge here to talk about Stadia in the past tense. And I apologize to anybody who still works on the platform. <laughs> like, in my mind, to a large degree, it's like, ah, oh, well, it's over. Let's just talk about what it was and where they screwed up. But, I, you know, it, it is still a going concern, but there are some things I want to talk about kind of from the perspective of, like, was this a screw up on their part? Um, I Look, if they if they if the plan is we're going to reinvest the money that we were spending on first party dev into getting more third parties on the platform in a more timely manner, then they absolutely screwed up by not saying that. Yeah. Right. Like it may be that that Phil didn't want to come out and say something that was going to be thrown back in his face six months from now when they haven't landed any new titles and everybody's pissed off. But but like, you know, either we're seeing death by a thousand cuts or a major shift in 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 the plan. And they didn't communicate that particularly well. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, you're right. This this could very well just be a pivot that we look back on and say, like, oh, that's when Stadia actually took off. I mean, you know, they're they're putting it in TVs this year, finally, and kind of those meat and potatoes moves they needed to be making before now. But um, does, does it work on the Chromecast that has a UI? The one with the uh, remote? I don't I mean, I don't have a Chromecast. I don't know the exact distinction, but I do know that there are still Chromecasts out there that it does not work on. Mm. I know that's the unfortunate. One, the one that you could buy as part of the actual Stadia starter kit. It worked. Uh, yeah, it's the ultra, I want to say I want to say the newest model out of the box does not support Stadia. If that's I'm the not, Chromecast TV, I think. I believe that's the case still. Um, so like they've got, you know, I, I assume they did some measure of kind of data center build out to support this thing right like that now they've got all these racks of stadia hardware sitting there (laughs) well but but racks of stadia hardware are probably just gpus and cpus and boxes that are used for this and for the machine like the thing this if you haven't ever gone and logged into like the the things that you get access to as a developer on google or amazon aws whatever like you can buy when 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 we were doing machine learning training, rather than run the machine learning training thing for a week in one of my engineers' basements, we just paid fifty bucks for the same amount of compute time over an hour, because like you're you're paying for compute cycles per per hour basically, and like you can use it for all sorts of weird stuff. If you have like data, if you have to munge a bunch of video, we used to use it to to compress the video that before it went up on YouTube in the old days it tested. Like it's it's um you, yeah it's it's less it's it's much more fungible than hey these are stadia racks in a data center someplace okay. it's not like that's the only thing they can be used for i mean i don't know that for sure but that's my assumption <clears throat> i mean they you know they there was kind of a fair amount of fanfare when they first announced the platform about like oh, we've just designed these custom server blades they're power more powerful than any console so yeah, but- they they are bespoke to some degree is is what the point that i'm making but it, so all of their blades are bespoke, though, because they design all their own hardware at this okay. point. It's not like they're buying blades and jamming, you know, 3080s or or, or Titan no, RTXs sure. into the blades. Yeah. Like, they, it's just it's just look. This is where Dyson Sphere Project comes in. <laughs> they're not building computers. They're building Comptronium, right? Uh-huh. They're building they're building matter that you can use for compute and storage without having to know anything about what the compute, the store, what, what the matter is. Slightly tortured analogy, but I think I'm with you. Yeah, it's uh. it's I mean, this. yeah, it's a weird thing. It's a weird way to think about computers when you're used to thinking about sure. a motherboard and a CPU and RAM and and, a, and a, you know, video card. Yeah. And I assume if you were one of these companies that's using the Stadia tech to build a streaming game, you would probably also be in for time on their infrastructure to actually serve it. Right. Because what else would you do? Well, so, I mean, that's a licensing question. I'm really curious. I'm I don't know. I don't know if they do. So, like, do you just pay? Do, do they look at the amount of time it's going to take to play Hitman 3 and they say, OK, I owe you, tr- you pay us X number of dollars distribution for every copy of this game that's sold? I don't know that IO is using Stadia for their back end on the Switch version of this game. But but like, how does that work? Nintendo's like, are you paying are, if somebody goes in and plays 3000 hours of Hitman 3? Does that mean IO loses money on that game? Like, how, how does this all break down? I'm I'm really curious about it. If at some point, if people keep playing that game for too long or is IO going to have to turn off because they're like, you guys are costing, you've run 3000 hours of this. You're costing us too much money. You're, 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 you're done. That's that surely, I mean, that could not be sustainable, right? Like who would actually agree to terms like that? 
Well, it's pretty cheap. I mean, compute's pretty cheap is the thing. I mean, it's not as cheap as storage, but it's trending cheaper. And that's like that's where that's where the Gmail thing makes a ton of sense, right? Like they're they're paying a lot of money for storage when they launched Gmail in 2003. But by 2010, the amount of storage that a Gmail account was a rounding a, a, a Gmail account took in their cloud was a not even a rounding error for a rounding error. It was nothing, <laughs> right? What it was, was it? A, uh, was it? First of all, it was 2004. Does that sound right? 2003 on April Fool's Day is when they launched Gmail. And do, do you remember? Was it a gig and a one half? One gigabyte. One one flat. And okay. it increased as you uh, the longer your account was alive. Right. Okay. So it was con- there was a little ticker that was constantly going. They stopped that after a while because yeah. it was, turns <laughs> out maybe not a great idea. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm I I I don't know. I'm it's weird. The whole thing is weird. I I'm wildly curious to see what they do with this and what the direction that this takes is. And it seems like, yeah, the Google TV, the Chromecast with Google TV still doesn't seem to have a Stadia app on it that yeah, I can I mean, see. If, there, if there's a bellwether for how much support this has internally, that seems like it. Yeah. But I don't know. You tell me. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, this this not this doesn't necessarily have a lot of bearing on the fact that they killed their first party development. This seems like it would matter more for third parties. But the fact that they made their hardware and their game development requirements Linux based. Like do you, um, do you, for Stadia. Yeah, because that's that's, that's kind of something people have been talking up as maybe a competitive advantage with Amazon's Luna stuff because you're just running Windows versions of games there and not requiring a, a, a bespoke port that you might not otherwise sink I time th- into if you weren't on Stadia. I think you have to have, I think the Luna slash GeForce Now approach is probably dramatically better if you want to get people on your platform, more people on your platform without having to spend a buttload of money. Totally. So like, what do you think? Do you have any insight into what might have driven that decision or what upsides there would be? Oh, so probably all of their cloud stuff runs on Linux and probably they didn't want to have to, um, they didn't want to have to build Windows versions of their like amazon offers windows terminals as a cloud server okay option i don't think google does so my guess is they didn't want to have like their back end shit just doesn't work on windows would be my guess so probably like down to the motherboard and chipset level they don't have drivers for windows for like core components of those racks and therefore they do that for to emulate it uh in virtual machines which is not super good or something else i don't know Maybe that starts to take us into the territory of like how projects are run inside of Google and then mm. what determines what survives and what does not. Because like looking at the Stadia announcement, I don't know if you remember that stream from a couple of years ago. I guess it's been about two years now. Like yeah. they had a, you know, they had a full on stage show, like the CEO of Google came out like the, he doesn't come out for everything for every product launch. You know, I mean, they hired they hired people like Jade Raymond and Phil Harrison, who are like big kind of longtime industry executive names, mm-hmm. uh, content people. Like, it seemed like they were getting behind it is is the point I'm trying to make. Like, there was a level of fanfare and kind of pomp around the launch of Stadia that you certainly don't see for every Google thing. But then you're talking about behind the scenes, maybe, you know, certain aspects of the company were not willing to build out massive infrastructure to support it in the way that it needed. Well, I mean, yeah, not not building out infrastructure is one thing, but like not going that's a that's like not supporting Windows on that is an example of not supporting the market that is the the like on consumer space windows is the market leader for games by an enormous ridiculous margin yeah so rolling out a linux project is going to say okay we're limiting limiting we're cutting out anything that ea ub and it's probably less of a deal for indies who are mostly using third-party game engines so for example if you're using unity it's not trivial, but it's not as difficult to cross compile a Linux version, right? If you're using Unreal, you can cross compile a Linux version. If you, but like a, a company like Supergiant that builds their own game engines has to then do the work of porting that thing over. And that's somebody working on, it's at least one person working for months and months and months. So you're looking at easily 50, 100, $250,000, which is a ton for a small developer. Right. Or like EA with Frostbite is probably a good big yeah, Frostbite. For example. Like I cannot imagine, I'd, I'd have to check and make sure that they don't ship stuff like Battlefield on Linux. I'm sure they, they do don't not. Though. Yeah. I can assure so like, you. So like something, something like, you know, a, a whole slate of Frostbite driven games, probably not going to get ported to Linux anytime soon. I don't know. Well, yeah, like, fuck, man, they can't get Frostbite to work on PC and PS3 until recently, PS4 until recently. So, Yeah. 
No, you're not going to see Frostbite on Stadia anytime soon. I don't think if it's, uh, I didn't realize it was a Linux based thing. Yes. That makes that a was, ton of sense though. Yes. That was kind of one of the big data points Oops. about it when it first, uh, first launched. I actually just pulled up a press release about from last year about EA getting into Stadia, but it's stuff like, it's stuff like Jedi Fallen Order, which is an Unreal game. Uh, yeah. And stuff so, like that. So. So if you, if you want that stuff to work, you can do that, but you have to spend a shitload of money, right? Like you have to throw money at it in a big way or else people aren't going to buy in because like, why is EA going to risk the half a million, you know, $200,000 it'll take to port a B tier game to run on Linux if, you know, Google doesn't have some cheddar in the, in the game. Okay. Well, that probably brings us fully into the second part of this episode. Because yeah. what company on the planet has more cheddar than Google? I mean, there might be a couple, but there Apple, aren't, there aren't Exxon, many. Right. So maybe Microsoft. Like, I don't know. Like, how do we get to, how do we get to the point where like barely a couple of years after Stadia was announced with all this fanfare, they feel like it feels like they're starting to cut and run before it ever really got started. Like, how does that, that you know, you don't work at Google any more than I do. Like, we don't know. Yeah. How things go internally there. But like, is is it just some massive bureaucracy with a bunch of different power bases working across purposes and I, like hmm i think that's microsoft that's that's the description i've always heard of my as a of, of microsoft where there's different divisions and different departments that are that are actively working to push their own narratives whether it's office versus windows versus entertainment versus you know um the thing i feel about that my understanding of google is that they are really really focused on growth um and the things that grow and are growing it like they're not afraid to kill something that's not growing it at the pace that they want even. So like where you or I have a business and, you know, if we if the tech pod was growing at 10 percent per month, 10 percent new subscribers a month, I would be thrilled. I would be doing cartwheels. Right. <laughs> if Google has something that's growing at 10 percent per month, they're like, yeah, it's OK. <laughs> We're never going to hit a billion users with this. Let's just shut it down and move on. Try to try again. And they do that all the time. Like there's a website of all the shit that Google has killed. Yes. Because they do this so often. It's become a joke, kind of. Yes, killed by Google.com. I, we brought it up, I think, on the last email episode briefly, but maybe it's time to dig into it a little bit more. But I mean, like, is there just no concept of sunk cost to them whatsoever? Because, like, they, you know, they put quite well, a bit of effort. The sunk cost fallacy it. is a fallacy for a reason. Brad. Well, I guess, I guess so. Uh, it's just, yeah. again, it, again, it just seems like they invested more in Stadia than they did. They have in quite I, a I mean, few of their products. But. So if they had asked me before they launched Stadia, and obviously they did not, because who cares what I think, th then I would have said, hey, if you want this to go and you want this thing to work, you need to spend a fuckload of money making sure that it has all of the games that people want to play. Because, like, yes, there's an argument for making the service for people who play these big live service games like Call of Duty and Destiny and stuff like that. But either you have to have enough people playing those games for this thing to work and the, the games to work, or you have to be able to make them cross platform with at least PC and ideally PS4 and Xbox as well. And it seems like on I don't like Destiny is just the Stadia people playing with Stadia people, right? I think. Yes, yes that's correct. Yeah. That's how PUBG works. So it was like that's PUBG added bots because of the Stadia <laughs> version. Oh. Um, like like so I, yeah, I don't know. It's it's super the whole thing's super it's 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 weird to me that you would spend this much money spinning this up. Probably the in reality, the video codec stuff that they're doing for games is probably applicable to a bunch of other stuff because suddenly latency and video is making a lot more sense. And we're going to see that more as like AR stuff starts to show up too, I think. Sure. Um, and that, and that is the technological advancement on Stadia. That's I think the most interesting is that they have a 1080p slash, I think for up to 4k even capable video codec that isn't encumbered by licenses that is developed in house that is incredibly low latency to render. And, 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 and that's, that's a trip. You can oh. think of some other applications for that, for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. What do you want to do with Killed by Google? Just you want to just start going down the list start and naming down things? Down the line here, see what we got here. Angular JS. What do you think? Uh, not, that's an web, open source we're, we're front end developers. framework. Yeah. I'm sure there's nerds that write web code that are really upset about that. It doesn't impact me. I was shocked that they killed Chrome apps, though. 
Because that's so, the thing that let you package apps to they're basically souped up extensions for Chrome. OK, so yeah, I've, I've seen them advertising that stuff, but I wasn't quite sure what the distinction was. So is that just stuff like docs and sheets like the standard? Yeah, but, but, but in plug in format, like they're kind a of key a, part of of Chromebook use. OK, so if you have a Chromebook, then you you probably have an icon on your desktop. Whatever that thing's called. That is a uh, docs docs. There were like photo editors and all sorts of stuff that like needed more front end UI, like Chrome control over the UI Chrome than you can get in a typical extension. So I, I'm curious about that one. I like whether they killed it because they're extending extensions or because nobody was using it or because it was like there also was a lot of malware in that section, too. So maybe that's the real reason. Um hangouts something yeah. i used daily for years totally, totally and like now there's google meet and I, I could not i am i've used both extensively and i could not tell you what the difference is well so hangouts is still embedded in gmail because there are two people that i talk to in there all the time <laughs> still with hangouts well you've still got another hangouts. five months four months i gotta get joey's cell phone number <laughs> um <laughs> you've got another four months to hang out with joey before they shut this thing oh, off no not joey um, but yeah, they've, they've done, there's a, there's a whole, probably a whole section down here of like the text replacements slash video conferencing replacements because they had Allo and whatever the other one was, the, 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 you know, the, the, it was supposed to, it was supposed to be like iMessage for Android, but it didn't fail over to SMS when you didn't have somebody on that system. So that meant anytime you tried to text somebody from there with an, I with an iOS account, it just, it just went into the ether and disappeared or failed, which was great. Loon. They killed loon. Uh, what is loon? Oh, loon was a Google X project where they were using these huge, <laughs> long duration stratospheric balloons to provide Wi-Fi to disaster areas and undeveloped oh, parts of the world. Not or not Wi-Fi, enough, but internet huh? service. <laughs> not showing enough growth. Look, the disaster relief is not a growth market. Google, I I would bet they looked at Starlink and were like, probably this balloon thing is going to be way harder <laughs> than having a bunch of satellites. That's fair. Starlink is a SpaceX's thing. Is that right? It's SpaceX's cell service. They're apparently starting to hit people for pre-orders. Um, and it's it's like it's like if you're beyond DSL range, like my parents live in rural Virginia and they can they can't get DSL or cable modems there. So right now they have a, a, a cellular modem on a tower that's a fixed antenna tower to a cell to a 4G tower that gives them like five megabits each way. So see this, uh, Starlink would be good for them. See the story going around recently about the guy who kind of de facto started his own ISP because he couldn't get good internet where he lived and he was just like, screw this. I'm just going to invest the Dude, that happens all the time. $150,000 or whatever it was to get yeah. a line run in. And then I will just start leasing it to my neighbors and it'll end up paying it for itself in like a year. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's like, if you live on a place with a hill in the country, you can do the, you can do that crate. Like, <laughs> especially if there's already a town, like the trick, the guy that my parents buy internet from sold, so lights gave rights to ta to build a tower on a hill in his cow on a, the cows were pasturing on and he retained rights to put his own shit on that tower when he did the deal. So Verizon came in and or Sprint or somebody came in and built a big ass cell phone tower on top of this hill for him. And then he just has to climb up and pay somebody to dangle off antennas every once in a while when somebody new signs on. And uh, he has like a DS3 or OC3 or something coming to his house now. So. Yeah, good for him. That's, wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, in <laughs> rural ass Virginia. That's that's better than gigabit. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try to remember to put this Ars technical link that I found uh, in the show notes okay. from last month. Jared Mosh in somewhere in Michigan. The pull quote: <laughs> "I had to start a telephone company to get internet access." Oof. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, Did you? This Google Home Max one is a trip. This thing's like a year, two, year, two three years old. I guess. I, I, I was actually going to mention how do you know how grim the language is on most of these. Well, kill twenty is intentionally kill, grim. Oh, I know that. I mean, I mean, there's a reason there are icons of guillotines next to most of these. Well, those are, those <laughs> are the grapes. ones that are not dead yes, yet, but are in the chopping and, block. And gravestones. I mean, yes, the whole thing is a little macabre. But uh, killed twenty two days ago. Getting unplugged in five months. Rip. Uh, actually, the one, the, the part where every one of these items ends with, it was about four years old. Yeah. It will, well, be, all, they, it will be over three years old. There's look, like something really awful and like childlike about the way that they. 
word the stuff. Look, they're using the time time command, right? Yeah. Um, Nest Secure was a uh, like made your Nest doorbell cameras into security cameras. Has the whole Nest uh, thing been ruined? Like, I feel like I just see nothing but people complaining about how much worse it's gotten after it got bought. Mm, I I did not. I don't know that I had any Nest stuff before it was bought. Okay. So I don't know what it was like before. I you my st- thermostat's fine. Yeah. That's the only thing I have. Uh I I from a feature set perspective and an Amazon being shitty perspective, I would advise absolutely everyone to get rid of their ring doorbells if that's what they have because Amazon shares stuff with co- with police departments and has like they're doing this new thing where they share your internet connection with other ring users. What? in the uh, ring device ring other ring users devices so like if you have better wi-fi at your property line with your neighbor and they have a ring camera on the property line then they'll use your wi-fi through the other ring devices on your network you gotta like get away like avoid Uh, ring. uh, whereas the nest thing if you have unlimited upstream uh does some really neat stuff like they do face recognition so you so like your nest tells you that it was the UPS person and and not like a solicitor when there's somebody at the door, huh? which is creepy, but also seems really useful. Yeah. Um, play music is a big one. This yeah. was like nine years old. People are pissed about it. That was one of the few on here that I actually used for some period of time. Like paid I, for I had it free with the YouTube TV for a while. Yeah, that's I, I can't remember. I can't remember which end I bought in on. I can't remember if I bought in on YouTube red slash TV or if I paid for play music. But anyway, uh, I yeah. don't know what the distinction is, but I see nothing but complaints about YouTube music, which is the successor to this or the replacement for it. Yeah, I know multiple people who've asked me for Spotify information because they're they're getting off of YouTube. Uh, this Google Photos print one is really silly. I, as, as a Google Photos subscriber, the idea that I would pay money to have Google pick out the 10 best photos from the last <laughs> month and mail them to me what? is like like. I mean, maybe if the price was right, I would have done that, but it seems kind of expensive. It didn't even make it a whole year. Um, what Especially else because, I mean, obviously they're just picking those photos algorithmically, right? Well, like, it does a really good job picking photos algorithmically that are at least hilarious. So like when they're when they're <laughs> bad, they're hilariously bad. Sure. Because um, we have one of the nest hubs in the in the kitchen and it has just like our most our 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 hit photos from the last month cycle through it. Um, and it's, it's pretty good. Like I, I had my iPhone do the, uh, I've never seen it do this before. This is actually my first experience with this feature period, but it automatically assembled a little like slideshow video presentation mm-hmm. of like photo memory stuff. It was like, I think it did it at the end of last year or so a couple months ago. And it was just like, there we've just put together your best memories from 2020. And because, you know, who the hell went anywhere and took pictures of anything in 2020, yeah. <laughs> it was nothing but pictures of food. It was yeah. entirely pictures of food, including a video that it inserted right in the middle with some really ridiculous jazz music where I had caught my fork wobbling on the edge of the plate. And I took like 30 <laughs> seconds of video of it. And it just shoved, shoved that right there in the middle of the I think it was on my Thanksgiving plate. And it so, was just like it was the most ridiculous, like assembled by robots kind of situation that I've had in some time. So the Google one is really the way Google does it is really neat. They the thing that the things that show up on the nest in the kitchen are like. Sometimes it's some like it's it's a it pulls from a bunch of different buckets. And one of them is like on this day in past years or around this day in past years. Some of them are things that it knows, like if it sees a cake in the picture or something like that, it'll know that that's like a celebration of some kind. It'll group some celebration pictures from the same time together. Some of it's like something that if two of the people that it knows live in the house, this is really creepy as I say this stuff out loud, but when it knows, since it knows that three of us live here, if there's two people in the photo and one person's not, it'll put that up because it thinks that maybe I want to see the picture of my wife and kid on a walk. Uh, that is a little bit much. Mm, I mean, look, you, I can also search for cat and it shows me all the pictures of cats. So, like, you get some convenience yes, in there. Pros, pros and cons, right? Yeah. Oh, hang. Remember, remember hosting all of our podcasts on Hangouts on Air, the number I'm... one service for having dropped video and audio. <laughs> if you want to do a production with a bunch of people on a YouTube YouTube stream. No, no. Rip. It was bad. Okay. God, I use so much of this stuff. Wow, they killed YouTube gaming. I missed that one. Wait. The gaming did, vertical did for YouTube. How did that I was in 2019. Don't. I also missed that. What the hell? Inbox by Gmail. Never forget. 
the best what email client I've ever used. That I, I was going to say, I think I think that of everything on this list that I've scrolled through is probably the thing that I saw the biggest outcry around when they killed it. Uh, like, g- no, Google Reader was the biggest outcry. Reader, you think so? Yeah, because Reader Reader was all the like no normal people use readers, but every journalist and huge extremely online person was that just reader like some kind of rss parser or something did you not use it it was fabulous i I don't know maybe imagine if you had gmail's tag like label functionality on news feeds and you dump all your feeds in there and it would prioritize the ones that it, it didn't do any algorithmic sorting so you could just scroll through and pick the you could hit you could put stuff in buckets based on the source or the author and so, like, if you only wanted to get Stephen Totillo post from Kotaku, you could really easily do that. And you could have, like, a top feed of all of the people that you like to read. It was very good. That actually does sound pretty good. Yeah, what but only up? nerds used it, so yeah. it, it got killed. What was up with Inbox? Like, is that a an alternate email client to the so, actual Gmail experience? Yeah, Inbox was a, pur- was, uh, a purchased, it was an acquisition, and it was a Gmail it was a custom Gmail client that let's see, how did it work? It, it kind of, it kind of sorted things into buckets the way Gmail does now. So like you had like purchase stuff and you had like newsletters and you had like, like the kind of spam that comes from signing up for forums and news, news groups and stuff like that. And it would sort them all and it would let you put all of the things in one category in the main inbox in like, a thing that you could blow up if you wanted, but you could just blow past it if you needed to. And it would let you set, uh, it would let you turn on notifications based on a single person. So like if I wanted to always see notifications when you sent me an email, because you rarely send emails and they're usually important, then I could do that, which was incredibly useful. That sounds very useful, actually. Yes. If, If you had a high volume inbox, it was incredibly powerful. If you didn't, low value. I do have a high volume inbox, but I still... Don't trust algorithmic email sorting. I just call me paranoid. I'm just too worried I'm going to miss something. I look, which I find I, if it's something which, really important, they text you, which which I'm which means that I invariably miss something because I'm sorting through like a couple hundred emails. A That's day. the thing is like, yeah, Um, I for what it's worth, I like I, hey has almost replaced inbox in my heart, but it's a hundred bucks a year. So your mileage may vary. So you're still you're still with them. I'm still, still using. Hey, still yeah. still on board. Yeah, it does. I I'm down at the beginning. I was filtering 30 or between 30 and 50 email addresses a day. Now it's usually 10 or 12. So, you know, I don't know. It's bad. Uh, Chromecast audio. That was a cool thing. And this is bumming me out. Glass OS. Was a version of Google's Android for Google Glass. Remember Google Glass? I have a pair of Google Glass in my garage. I can't even say Google Glass three times fast. It was really hard to say. Wait, you um, still have Google, I still have a pair. Huh. I haven't plugged them in in years. The battery's probably exploded. I should hope not. Um, the Google search appliance. This was a cool thing. You could plug it into your intranet. Remember those? And it would run Google indexes on your document shares. Huh. Interesting. So, so you could Google your, your, your file server. Weird. That is weird. And, and it would be off the main and ind- like it would be private was the gist. Um, there are some really dumb names in here. Yeah. Songza. Oh, man, they killed Soundstage. That's a bummer. I think that one got open. Oh, the other thing we were going to talk about is Tilt Brush. Tilt Brush, they basically said, hey, dog, we're we're just going to end up. We're going to this is dead, but it's open source now, so you can make it your own, which is actually a cool way to kill stuff, I guess. Do you think and I mean, not that we have any special insight, but do you think they were just going to kill it and then somebody like went to bat for letting it live on? In an open format instead, I would say there's probably enough people using that that if they hadn't made it somewhat maintainable in the future in some way, there would have been a it would have been like they turned a bad press situation to a good press situation sure. by taking the effort to open to make that open. Yeah. Um, what else? I'm going to scroll down a lot. I'm Google just I'm schemer. Just, yeah, I'm just going through looking at all these bad product names now. Bump with an exclamation mark. That is that the. Oh, oh, I remember that. That's when they had an NFC. So you could bump the phones together. Yes. And, and the accelerometer <laughs> would register the movement and hit the NFC tag and be like, OK, I know you. Yeah, let's transfer Never contact information bumped. now. Yeah. It was kind of like squirting music from Zoom to Zoom. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, man. 
Oh, the Nexus Q was that they did a big deal about that. That was the digital digital audio player that they showed. Like it was a, it looked like a pre mini pre Nest or Alexa. It was a little tiny orb, and it was all loaded with speakers and stuff, but no microphones. I think. Um, Google Talk. Remember that Google G Chat. What was Google? Is that what that was? Yeah, it was an XMPP. Right. Yes, I used to log into that through Pigeon. Uh huh. Or or Trillion would work too. What are you chatting on now? Is that Hangouts that you're Hangouts. technically typing into? Yeah, so they killed Talk. They renamed Talk Hangouts, I think, is what okay. technically happened. Okay. And they took out the XMPP support, maybe. I right. can't remember. God, remember IM clients? Jeez. Yeah, those were good days. Uh, Picnic became Google Photos. Some of these are not actually killed. Some of them got converted into other things. Sparrow was the email client that became Inbox. I remember Sparrow. Yeah. Oh, huh, okay. It was 10 might- bucks. In the app store started on on mobile, right? Uh huh. I think I I think I used Sparrow for a little while. Google Wave, uh, the stuff from it ended up getting rolled into Docs and all that stuff. Uh, but that was like anybody can write in the document anytime. It right. Would support infinite users and all that yes. stuff. Right. I'm um, amazed we've made it this far without talking about Google Plus. Nobody ever needs to talk about Google <laughs> Plus again. <laughs> right. It's, it's not even on here. Do you How's remember Google possible? Buzz? That was the social networking, microblogging, and messaging tool that was integrated with Gmail. Sure. It predated Plus. I'll take your word for it. Remember, they they gave you a place to make public statements inside the place that you make private statements, and nothing possibly could ever Mm. go wrong with that. Yes, of course. I I don't know how Plus is not on this list, actually. It's on the list. You just missed it. It's up near the top. Search for the word Plus. Yeah, you got to search for a Plus. Oh, like a literal plus sign? Literal plus sign. Is that what the branding was? Yep, Google Plus. 2011 to 2019. Killed almost two years ago. I I don't know why in my memory it was a spelled out full word, but... It's because bad branding. Yeah. Uh, What Um, What do you think is the most mocked product on this list? Plus, probably. Like the the, the most... uh, Dodgeball. The the target of the target of the most... Dodgeball anymore. Wait, what is Dodgeball. Dodgeball was a social media for lo- lo- location based social media. So you uh, they it was a startup they bought. Oh, but that's like early social 2003. It was early social media. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I, I think uh, to me, plus is by far the target of the greatest mockery on this list. Google Google plus was bad. Yeah. Remember circles? Buzz was bad, though. I think ba- I think buzz was actually worse than plus. Which is it's really possible. saying something. It's, it's entirely possible. Um, oh, you're right. Yeah, like they list Grand Central on here as being killed, but it flat out says acquired it, by Google and turned into Google Voice, which is going strong. Yeah, and Google Voice is basically the, like they've done basically nothing to it since Grand I, Central. Uh, since since they shut down Grand Central. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess Plus is probably the thing most worthy of mocking here. I don't know. Maybe maybe the. Maybe the Google TV stuff. Did you ever actually see the Google TV we had at, no. at, at tested? It had, you know how the Apple remote for the Apple TV has like five buttons on it, six buttons. And it's really, it's really lovely and smart. And like, it's, it's simple to use. And like anybody picks it up and you know exactly what you do. And like, this is where you press and this is where the, you, how you move the cursor and all that. Yeah. The, the Google TV, the original Google TV remote, the one that we got from Sony was about the size of a big PDA from the late 90s. Mind you, this is in 2010 or 2011. Oh, my and it God. It had a full keyboard. It had two D pads. I'm looking at it right now. This Are you looking at the Sony one? Holy shit. Yes. What yeah. in the world? Who? What? Who thought this was a good idea? No one. This is literally grotesque. no one. Also, it didn't work. Like there were no apps. I don't even think you could get Netflix on it. Why you launched something without Netflix, even in 2010, was was shocking. Oh, it's, it's even it's even better that the photo I managed to find is of a very grungy, extremely used one. Ugh. It just looks filthy. Gross. <laughs> oh, now we have an episode image. Uh, Gross. Yeah, I, I don't know why I wanted to try to, to ascertain like what is the most uh, the most mocked product on here. I think it's just because the Valley Press seems so vicious. A lot of the oh, time, Google Pie was really stupid too. That was yeah, when they I, tried to come at Slack with a terrible thing, and they called it Pie. That's not nothing about the word Pie. It makes me want to again. talk to people about work. It just makes me want to eat Pie. <laughs> of course, mm. to be fair, I guess the word Slack doesn't necessarily 
promote the desire to work either. Yeah, but they were the first ones that did it. So, you yeah, know, that's fair. The Chromebook Pixel was really ridiculous, too. It was a thousand dollar Chromebook, which is Yikes. insane. Is the, I saw that on here. I assume the regular Chromebook line is still trundling yeah, right along, right? Selling bazillions of them this year. Really? Half of the school systems have them. Like our school, my school system handed them out to everybody who didn't have a computer. No kidding. Wow. When the, when the quarantine started. Are they X, still x86 based? I don't think all of them are. I think they're a mixture of ARM and x86. Huh. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, done Google, a lot. what are you going to do? They They've kill done a stuff. Lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a, it's a force of nature. It's a fact of life at this point. I mean, look, there, I'm sure there's an equally long list someplace of products that Google hasn't killed. They got search. They got ads. They got all that cloud hosting crap. They got uh, Keep. That one's probably mm-hmm. not long for the world, though, because you looked at me. You just gave me the what the hell is Keep look. Um, I'm sure there's other things. They, yeah. they do. They do stuff. Google's going to do what Google's going to do. That's it. Uh, uh, is this the time of the show when we uh, think? Oh, first off, next week, I believe. Yes. Well, we, in the next two weeks, we're going to do a and a episode, an email okay. episode. OK, so if you have yes. emails, you should send them in to techpod at content dot town. Yes, that's techpod at content dot town. Oh, my God. We're going to be back on the last week of the month schedule for emails. Yes, we are. I wanted, to, I wanted to I wanted to I wanted to prime that pump before right. we get to that point. Um, and then they can be about stuff we've talked about on the show. They can be about random stuff that you have questions about. They, you know, send them in. We don't care. Brett, no cannibalism, please. That's my request. <laughs> oh boy. Um, what have, what have we done? Look, when you have to put a, please don't send any more emails about cannibalism. in, that's a real, real turning point for any young podcast. Yeah. Um, but it's the time of the show where we thank our patrons. Yes. Thank you. Patrons. <laughs> thank we really you so appreciate much. you. Yes. Um, yeah, you, uh, if you want to be a patron of the show and support the show, uh, with money instead of just time, which we appreciate either one really, uh, then for two bucks a month, you can get access to the fabulous tech pod discord where you, uh, can hang out with like 1400, 1500 other wonderful nerds and talk about all sorts of things. We just started a science channel. Did you do yes, that? We did. I did that. In okay. Fact. I, I someone, assumed you did. Someone so asked. Someone, by someone, I mean our friend Doug Ellison oh. from JPL. Science who, Doug, we call him. If, if anyone if anyone were in a position to request a science channel, I would say it's him. Look, if Doug asks for a channel, I'm going to give Doug a channel. That's all. That's all. He gets, he's been a double guest. He's the first yeah. double guest. So I mean, if, if anybody else on the server also drives robots on other planets, they too can request a science channel. <laughs> Look, and actually... Not you don't have to be dug to really to uh, request know, a channel. You're right. That's a pretty high bar. Anybody right. actually can request. Uh, yes, like, but we do. Yeah, Chapel asked for a F1 racing channel once, and we we made that happen. So, or sports channel maybe. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, especially with I mean we you know that's what we had dug on to talk about, but with Perseverance landing next week or is it the week after the 18th? 18th. So wow, six days is, from today. Holy crap! That is less Wednesday, than a week from the time of this recording. Uh, even less time by the time you hear this Thursday, Wednesday, it's good, something it's good next week sometime. It's good that we have that channel so people can talk about the landing now. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta find out what time that's happening. I kind of want to follow along. It's around life. lunchtime. Is it? Yeah. Okay. 1130 is what Kishore said the other day, oh, that's, but that's they'll, exciting. They'll know. I think when we talked to Doug a few weeks ago, it was 1238 is what they were shooting for. But, um, I, yeah, I so you have, gotta, I'm oh. sorry. I have to say just, I'm just to push the discord here. When you mentioned the discord, I opened it briefly. Yeah, what did you land on? Someone, someone who is a veteran of the Navy saying, what I feel like every time I tell my old Navy stories and they posted a picture of Cup from Transformers the movie. So <laughs> this is a good server to align with my personal interests, at least. That's pretty good. Um, so, yeah, if you want to get in on the Discord, you can. We do a, a patron exclusive podcast once a month. Uh, uh, all sorts of good stuff all the time. And uh, you can find out about that at Patreon. Uh, sorry, TechPod. Nope. You can find out about that at patreon.com slash tech pod. There you go. Uh, And always, as always, we want to thank our executive producer level patrons, the bunny fiend, Jacob Chapel, David Allen, and James Kamek. Thank you all so much. And thanks everybody. uh, Whether you listen, whether you back the Patreon, whether you tell your friends, we appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Also tech pod folks pushed my daughter almost to her cookie goal last week. Oh my God. So That's amazing. Uh, if anybody wants some Girl Scout cookies, you don't know any Girl Scouts in real life. You can find cookies at cookies.techpod.com. 
do you just get uh like a is there just a thermometer thermometer filling up on your end or do you get actual breakdowns of like who's buying what or oh, what I is know. selling well, the most yeah cuz like theoretically in a normal year we would deliver them by hand sure well i mean um, this this current wave i'm just curious what's uh you mean i don't i don't have like a i don't think i have data analytics about which cookies are the most popular unfortunately but let me look and see uh my girlfriend that's got some coworkers children sell her daughter selling at her workplace yeah and it, it was it was suggested in the course of all that happening that nobody likes the lemon ones fuck them the lemon Is ones that, are dope okay i, I thought people that were was, giving you bad information I thought, I thought that was i mean they're not my favorite to be clear but i thought that was maybe a little harsh toward the lemon ups look if you want to talk about my okay my official stated policy is that all girl scout cookies rip okay <laughs> that's fair i mean you know what <laughs> cookies are better than no cookies i'll say yeah. that but what I'm what I'm going to say right now, this is just between you and me. We're not going to put this out. Nobody like shh. Samoas kind of suck, dude. What? No. Coconut. No. Man. Don't eat coconut. Coconut's uh, bad. What? Why? It's just gross. Is it actually all, bad or is it just a personal preference? No, I just don't like it. Uh, I think it tastes fine. bad. Coconut's fine. Um, if I was st- if I was stack ranking the Girl Scout cookies, Thin Mints, number one with a bullet. <sighs> Lemon oh, Ups, know, number man. two. Dosey Dose, those peanut butter sandwich cookies. Number three, Trefoil's number four. We have um, ex- extraordinarily different taste in Girl Scout cookies. S'mores, I have to say. very good. The s'mores, mm. I might actually put the s'mores above the dosey dough when I think about it because it's okay. the better sandwich cookie now. I have not had the s'mores. I might be, I, I could see that. I, the dosey doughs are very good. I think s'mores yeah. are just fine. Uh, thin mints, I feel, are very, fairly middle of the pack. Get. Uh, wow. We got so we got a box though, and they went straight in the freezer. So I had frozen thin mints, which was quite an experience. Have you never had frozen thin mints? You got to put them in the freezer. I don't think I had ever. I didn't really seek out thin mints. Like I said, you know, they're a mid tier. Do you not like mint? That's fine. Do you not like chocolate? It's fine. It reminds me a little bit of toothpaste. If you're using chocolatey toothpaste, man, that is messed <laughs> up. That's not the part that. Uh, I think tagalongs might be my number one. You know, the peanut butter and tagalongs. I like the tagalong, but I, I don't I don't like that, that. That kind of like cookie slash candy peanut butter is not my favorite thing. Really? Oh, yeah. Man, it's just like it's like a Reese's peanut butter cup in cookie form. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't get a. Unfortunately, I don't get a breakdown by variety of cookie. Oh, that's a shame. It's a real letdown for all of us. I would love to know. God damn it. I mean, I, I could go through manually and find I have it. To, but I have to close this. Pit. Nothing against your daughter, but I have to close this page. Or you should just get some cookies, Brad. I'm not supposed to be eating cookies right now. Don't eat cookies right now. If they're bad for you. Um, but yeah, uh, that's cookies.content.town. We'll see you all next week, I guess. <laughs> you guess? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. So I want to hear a little more certitude here, please. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you all next week. Next week.